Lagos being the epicenter means we have uh, the risk or we carry the risk of more people being infected at a rapid rate if there were no measures in place to mitigate the transmission of the virus, which was why Lagos State was proactive enough to have set up an uh, emergency team, response team, as far back as February, when Mr. Governor became the incident commander for that team in order to be able to put steps and measures in place to combat the pandemic. And truthfully, or as we saw it pan out, from the month of March and then into April, where we saw a rise in transmission, we could all see that Lagos was definitely ready to combat it. But thankfully, because of the proactiveness of our governor and then the likes of the Ministry of um, Health, we've been able to at least stem the tide or nip it in the bud as best as we can. Now, for the Ministry of Agriculture, how did we play a key role? The approach of Mr. Governor in battling this pandemic was three-pronged. The first was the health uh, sector or the health front, which already the Ministry of Health in conjunction and other the leadership of Mr. Governor, they were already battling it and ready to tackle it. So we could see the efforts being put in place, putting up isolation centers even before we had outbreaks and stuff like that. Now, the second leg of that tripod was food security. And then the third leg was security in itself. So you have health, you have food security, and the security. Because at the end of the day, everything being done on the health front still stands to, um, to be swayed if food security was not properly handled. And then that would have cascaded to a sense of insecurity within Lagos, which in a way we saw a little bit of that at the beginning of the lockdown period in the month of April. So on the health front, we were doing very well. Then the next thing was, if we announce a lockdown, how would people move about? How would the daily income earner be able to afford to feed himself or herself if they are unable to go out of the house? And in response to that, on the 27th of March, Mr. Governor flagged off the COVID-19 emergency food response initiative of Lagos State, where the idea was, okay, let's see how we can even feed 200,000 households in the first leg, and then subsequently we'll see how this pans out, depending on how long the pandemic was for or the lockdown was for. And I can bet you that as we speak today, we have distributed food items to over 500,000 households. That is translating to over 3 million people, and we are still doing it. People say, oh, the food didn't get to me. It didn't get... Of course, it won't get to everybody. We can only do so much. But Lagos State was the first state in Nigeria to have an emergency food response initiative or palliative, and even the first in Africa. And I can bet you that even in other climes, Western world, you can mention the likes of the UK, the US, they also struggled. So if anyone had expected that this initiative would have been an outright um, all-round success on all fronts where everybody was happy. It's impossible. So all we did was let's look at those that will be greatly affected by this lockdown, by this pandemic, whose sources of livelihood or income will be greatly affected, and let's see how we can offer some succor in that direction. And during that period, I believe we did quite well. There may have been hiccups along the way, but as we fine-tuned our strategy, we got better at it, and we believe that we were able to reach as many people as we could. And that's what we had done during the lockdown period. Now, post-lockdown, which is what we are in now, we also realized, not that we realized, it's a given fact. Lagos is one of the smallest states geographically in the nation, and also the fact that Lagos is so urbanized, you don't have as much land for agriculture. So already you have the constraints of land size, and then you also have the constraints of the kind of population we have, which are more urban than semi-urban or rural. You would expect, or as it is in other states or in other places, where you have food production, it's mostly in the rural community. So if Lagos is not having as much rural communities as we would want, it also translates into the fact that we won't be producing as much food as we should, meaning we would have food insecurity challenges. And Lagos State, when you look at the terrain, we are surrounded by water. So Lagos being the city of aquatic splendor, it means we have another constraint. But then it is also a blessing because when you have water bodies, what it means is you have abundance of fish or you can go into fish production, which we call aquaculture. So in a way, it's a kind of a blessing to us 
and laid out the roadmap that we have for the next five years is to see how we can up our security, food security levels from the current 18, 20% to 40, 50% within the next five years. It's going to be a great feat to achieve because if you are trying to achieve food security status up to half, 50% in the next two, three, four years, then great strides would have to be taken. And one of the pillars of the Mr. Babaji Olusola Songolu um, agenda, the things agenda, is making Lagos a 21st century economy. That's the fourth pillar. And under this fourth pillar is where agriculture features. And under this is where we want the ease of doing business in agriculture to be at the forefront. Because at the end of the day, if the youth that we are trying to draw into this space do not see the sector as being attractive enough, then we have a major problem on our hands. In other parts of the country, you have farmers of all ages doing the work or at least producing. Here in Lagos, you have a young population, meaning it is the youth that you have to attract into the space. And if that sector is not made as attractive enough for them, then we are going to be in massive uh, trouble. So the thing is, how do you make being in this space easy? How do you make it investable? How do you make it a place where opportunities are bound that the youth can easily latch on basis what they know today and how they can implement that in food production or food security? So that is actually one of the key levels we want to exploit, how to draw in the youth. And how do you draw in the youth into the space? It is through technology. So when we say technology, it's easy to think Technology, in the, when you look at agriculture in Nigeria or in sub-Saharan Africa, we are still very much behind, meaning technology that may be used in the U.S. in agricultural space, maybe in the last 10 years, it may be what is applicable to us right now, for us to now gradually scale up to the level where they are, maybe within the next couple of years. So the thing is, how do we even move from our subsistence-based agriculture now to a more kind of um, robust agriculture in terms of production, in terms of use of data, in terms of use of technology, for us to even graduate from our 18, 20% food security levels to get into 30, 40, and then 50%. So a lot of these um, avenues are being exploited. And the best way to do that exploitation properly is to assess each value chain. So in that value chain, when you assess it, there are loopholes in each and every of that link. And within that, you can begin to look at where the opportunities lie in closing the gap, which is where technology can feature. So if I look at, let's say, within the marketing and distribution space, the use of technology, it's as simple as I need a database of reliable distributors. How can I get that database? I can decide that, you know what, as a youth, I can set up a firm to do credit assessment of would-be or potential distributors. And how do I do that assessment? I can begin to find information from people around you. Okay, this person, how many warehouses does he have? Is he reliable? Um, how many staff does he have? How long has he been in this business? Which banks does he bank with? And from having that credit assessment, I've already, that means I have a credit um, um, assessment data that I can now share with companies that are within that space in terms of distribution to say, you know what, if you want your rice to be distributed well, this guy is a good guy. Use him. And that information, you can actually sell it because if I were to be a company in the distribution space, I would want that information because that way I am also kind of securing my finances, I'm securing my products because I know that, okay, the person I'm actually giving it to is reliable enough to pay me back. So loopholes like that along each link within the chain can be exploited just by being focused and saying, okay, I can use a little bit of organization around data, organization using technology to ramp up and then to do what I need to do. So within agriculture, technology is definitely one key platform that Mr. Babaji Dodeshola so wants us to exploit. And then we have a host of other things. Aside that, um, we are also looking at in ramping up food production. Yes, we may not have the land, but we still have clusters that can be developed. We have farm settlements, we have farm estates that are underutilized. How can we ramp up production in these spaces? It's by making sure that the infrastructure within such estates they are good enough, and it's also to get potential investors that are serious enough to want to do business. Definitely. So we do the. Um, Agreed Value Chains Empowerment Program. So obviously, as the term connotes, empowerment means you're giving something to someone to help them. 
either to ramp up production, maybe to build up skill sets, anything at all that will just augment what you are currently doing. So the empowerment program it's done on an annual basis. We did it last year. We're doing it sometime next week, Tuesday as well, where the farmers in the different or the producers in the different value chains that are prevalent in Lagos, from pigry to poultry production to aquaculture to crop vegetable production and so on and so forth, marketers as well. So it's not even just for producers in but for everyone within the value chain. We empower them with tools, with implements, with seedlings, with feed. So anything that would help to augment their business, anything that would help them at least to kind of subsidize, especially on the losses made during the post, uh, during the lockdown period. These empowerment programs, they are on a continuous basis. We actually even started way back during the lockdown. We had already started giving out feed and other things to our producers, and we are still continuing, and it will still continue that way till the end of the year and beyond. I believe capacity building skill set is still a form of empowerment as well. We are currently doing trainings, even coconut arts and crafts, that is even currently ongoing in the Ministry of Agriculture, Waste to Wealth, that's the tagline. And the idea behind it is, okay, the youth, they are at home, they are not in school, obviously, and then they need to get engaged in different sorts of things. You have the coconut as a cash crop being underutilized or underexploited in Lagos, in Nigeria as a whole, sub-Saharan Africa. Every part of the coconut is useful. That is why it is called the tree of life. So we felt, okay, under our agency, La Skoda, Lagos State Coconut Development Authority, what are those things that we need to do keep, to keep our youth constantly engaged, to let people see that, you know what, this cash crop, it has so many uses. So the idea was, how do you convert the coconut husk or the coconut shell to different forms of art? I'm sure you will see, you can check on social media, you see pictures of Mr. Governor himself in coconut, actually used uh, coconut, you know, to bring out a an image of him, and then you see so many other things as well. You can have cups, you can have trays, like what I have here. All this is made of coconut. So these are the kind of things that we're trying to also teach students to say, hey, there are different things that can be done, and then subsequently you can even get into the space of making these things, selling them, or teaching other kids as well. So a lot of these things, they are 360 degree, uh, revolving, and um, inclusive such that in terms of empowerment we make sure that everyone is carried along. I need to make Lagos a destination for investors to want to come into. So regardless of the sector, be it housing, be it energy, be it agriculture, Lagos has to attract investors and agriculture is obviously a very key pillar in all of that. So we are doing all we can to ensure that you know what, if you need anything around agriculture in Lagos State, we can make it available to you as quickly as possible and as um, holistic enough for you to make your decisions as possible. Which is why we are open to receiving proposals, we are open to receiving uh, requests for partnerships, so long as it makes sense on both sides, it's a win-win situation. And we are also open to like, you know what, we have this available, but we need people to invest their money in this. We'll make this as easy and as seamless for you as possible. And then, I believe that we have success stories all around. So it's just a function of, if you think of, uh, agriculture is for you, then we are open to also partner with you on it to make your journey come true. So, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome.